yeah, if anybody is so wanting, there are probably parts of Ken Block's motor on the side of Pikes Peak Highway <laughs> right now. <laughs> if you want to find a valve stem somewhere, um, the, the head of the valve was thankfully stuck in the valve seat, but there are some parts that made it through that turbo and it wiped it out pretty good. <laughs> Welcome to the HPA Tuned In Podcast, I'm Andre, your host, and in this episode we're joined by return guest Sander from Obsidian Motor Group. Now we wanted to get Sander back on the podcast because he has been recently involved in what is a very high profile car, specifically I'm talking here about Hoonigan's Huna Pegasus, it's, it's a hell of a mouthful but hopefully I got that out right. Uh, if you haven't seen this car on the internet I honestly don't know where you've been, it has been everywhere and it is an absolute work of art. There's been a lot of press about this car, specifically around the fact that unfortunately for Pikes Peak Hill Climb 2022 didn't quite go to plan unfortunately with a fairly catastrophic and unrecoverable engine failure in practice leading up to the event. Was it for a lack of effort on the team and all involved trying to get it back together? But unfortunately this is a very specific engine and access to replacement parts just uh, wasn't there to get it back and running in time. Now why we wanted to get involved here again with Sander is that he is the brains here behind the electronics system. He's been involved with BBI Autosport, the builder of this car uh, for a number of years and we've talked already on the podcast to him about his previous involvements at Pikes Peak but this was an opportunity for Sander as well as BBI Autosport to really let loose and try some uh, pretty cool stuff and we dive into the electronics setup, uh, why the car is running not one but two Motec M142 ECUs, all of the other trick electronics that Sander has brought into the package including including his own bespoke INS system, how he's using that for geofencing some of the control strategies, specifically the control strategy around the uh, hydraulic adjustable ride height which is really important to getting the aero package on this car to work. In short, a huge amount of information and for anyone who has been following that particular car uh, this will really expand your knowledge on what goes in to running this car and what went on behind the scenes. And before we get into our interview for those who are new to the HPA Tuned In podcast High Performance Academy is an online training school we specialise in teaching people all manner of performance automotive topics, specifically we cover engine tuning, engine building, wiring, we also cover race car setup, race driver education and data analysis, we've also even got fabrication courses. Relevant to today's topic is our engine tuning courses and specifically we have our engine tuning fundamentals course, our EFI tuning fundamentals course which will teach you as its name implies the fundamentals behind EFI tuning, how a few fuel injected system works. What we're trying to do when we're optimising the fuel and ignition timing. From here I'd also recommend our Understanding Air Fuel Ratio course. This will teach you what air fuel ratio is, why it's important, we give you safe starting air fuel ratios for a range of different engines, then we teach you most importantly how to test and find the optimal air fuel ratio for your particular application. Lastly when you want to bring all of this theory knowledge together we've got our practical standalone tuning course which will teach you how to tune an aftermarket standalone ECU doesn't matter the brand of ECU, it doesn't matter the type of engine you're tuning. We cover the fundamentals that are applicable across the board. Now I know that when you're faced with a freshly installed ECU with no start file, no base map, it can be pretty daunting knowing what to do first and what order to progress in. Well, What we've done is we've broken the entire tuning process down into the HPA 10 step process and by doing this each of those individual steps is quick and relatively easy to complete and in no time you've got a completely tuned engine that's offering great power, great torque, great drivability and most importantly great reliability. 
Follow this on with our library of worked examples where you can watch that 10 step process being applied in real time from start to finish on a real tuning job. Here we vary both the type of ECU we're tuning as well as the type of engine we're tuning to give you broad experience on a range of different applications. Now we will put a link to those three courses in the show notes so you can find them easily. They're also at hpacademy.com forward slash courses and as an HPA tuned in podcast listener you can use the coupon code podcast 75 that'll get you $75 off the purchase of your very first HPA course again there's a link to that coupon in the description all right let's get into our interview now all right Sander welcome back to the tuned in podcast uh, you're our first repeat guest so great to have you along and uh while I don't think we kind of got finished on everything we had to chat about last time, we have brought you back this time for a really specific reason in that you have had the pleasure of being involved in a very high profile car, the Huna Pegasus, which I am still struggling to get my tongue around, but an amazing build. And I wanted to dive into your involvement in this car. Uh, I've just freshly finished the the Hoonigan documentary on it, which was really interesting, but we want to dive a, a lot deeper into uh, the, the details, which is really where you come in. So just for those who are fresh to the podcast, we have had you on it already, Sander. So I'm going to kind of skip our usual strategy where we sort of dive into your background. We will put a link into our last interview with Sander in the show notes. So if people want to find out a little bit more about the, the deep background of Sander, they can go check that out. But let's let's dive into this car. And from what I understand, the, the car's essentially been built by BBI Autosport. It's a big collaboration. We've obviously got Ken Block and Hoonigan involved in here, some really big names. Uh, can you tell us for a start about your previous involvement with BBI? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, so my involvement with BBI has just been that in 2019 and 2021, they campaigned a 991 GT3 Cup car that was turbocharged for the uh, Pikes Peak International Hill Climb. And I had been the one that was on site to configure and set up all the MoTeC electronics and then handle the engine tuning as well. So there's probably plenty of tuners in the US that BBI could have called on. H- how do you how do you get your hat in the in the mix there to to take that job? Yeah, it's a good question. Um uh, one of their their general manager and sort of head of engineering is a longtime friend of mine, and uh, he contacted me in 2019 when they were in a pinch to do this pretty short timeline uh, build and configuration on their cup car that they used in 2019 and 2021. And I'd like to say that it's my good looks or in- incredible knowledge, but it was more just the fact that I was able to make time for them to set up their car in a really short time frame. And they knew that I would do the job well because I had a friend there that said that I was smart and I could handle it. So. <laughs> well, let's be honest, that friend didn't, didn't lie. You're definitely the, the smartest guy I know for the job. <laughs> in terms of this, you've mentioned the, the short time frame, and we'll, we'll dive into this with the, the Huna Pig as well. It, it sort of seems to be a uh, sort of a, a constant theme here with these these builds. How, how does this happen? Yeah, it's a really unfortunate trend, and honestly, the the, Huna, uh, the excuse me, the BBI folks don't like this. Like it, it's sort of con- conveyed like they're they sort of uh, thrive in this really last minute, ultra late. Uh, builds like they like to do it, but it's just sort of the way that funding works out sometimes. And it's just the way that things fall together. Uh, it was a little sad that the, the Huna Pegasus came together in a, such a short time frame, but at the same time, it's, uh, it was a monumental effort and I, I wouldn't change anything about it at this point. I, it's, it sort of seems to go hand in hand with motorsport really no no matter how well you plan no matter how big the team is and how well funded it is it just seems that there's always going to be some last minute push right at the end and unfortunately we've, we've gone through that ourselves sometimes it works which is obviously really refreshing and and is just payback for all of the the hard work and the long hours that get put into it other times it 
doesn't quite work out and go to plan, which is the case sadly this time. We'll talk more about that. But uh, yeah, that, that seems to go hand in hand with motorsport. Just before we jump into the Huna Pegasus in a bit more detail, uh, just to refresh our, our memory, so your results with BBI back in 2019-2021, can, yeah, how, how did the car go? Yeah, so we did quite well in 2019. Um, we still have the record for the fastest Porsche ever to go up Pikes Peak in all of history, so that's that's not bad. Um, we also won the class uh, and set the TA1 record at 923, I think. And in 2021, we did not do a full run up the mountain due to weather, but we won open class that year and had a bit of bad luck with the weather, but I think we would have been on on pace to beat Romain Dumas, who was driving the GT2 RS Club Sport for champion that year. He just sort of coincidentally had better weather than we did at the top, and so we had to slow down. But did pretty well both years. It's a short answer. That is one of the the challenging aspects of of Pikes Peak, and I mean the 2022 running was even more dramatic. But but it is so weather dependent, and the conditions can change so dramatically across the day. And at least a couple of times I've been there, the the common theme seems to be that the morning is the time when you want to run, and as the day goes on, the, the weather seems to deteriorate, which, as you mentioned, 2021, the, the course was shortened due to, I think there was snow on the top section of the mountain, wasn't there? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, so probably not a fair fight, and I'm guessing not too many uh, competitors brought along their studded snow tyres either. All right, let, let's get on to the Huna Pegasus, and, and I'm interested, like, how did, that, how did that conversation even start? How did it come onto your radar? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and it, it's kind of like the dream scenario for anybody that's in my position. Uh, in late 2021, which is November or December, um, I was down in Southern California for help BBI out with another project that they were working on for uh, a client. And uh, but Tim and Dimitri uh, of BBI uh, took me out to dinner and they were saying like, hey, you know, we have this potential car that may or may not come together. Uh, and it's an opportunity where it needs to do X, Y, and Z. And we would essentially give you the free reign to do almost whatever you want, uh, within a, a, a somewhat, a somewhat sensible, a pretty sensible budget. Um, okay. sensible meaning, you know, pretty, pretty big budget, but just more or less like here's a car that's going to have a bunch of fancy stuff on it and cool controls. You can do whatever you want. We'll probably approve the invoice. So do you want to be a part of it? And I was like, yeah, of course. It sounds great. Yeah, who, who's going to say no to that? I mean, that's exactly. all we really want to do as, as engine tuners is get to play with the latest and greatest and have essentially uh, free say that to do as we wish to get the best result, correct? That's exactly right. Yeah, that is the dream. All right, so so what is the, the scope of work required or, or what was discussed at that time in terms of, of what you would need to bring to the table? Yeah, so uh, we we knew early on that it would have to be a direct injected engine um, because the engine format for that car is a 2017 991 GT3 R engine, which architecturally is somewhat similar to the 991 GT3 RS engine in that it's uh, has a couple of neat internal engine components, but the the main point being is that it has two synchronous direct injection pumps on each bank um, and. So that was a thing, and it was going to be DI. Uh, and they, we had talked in 2021 about using methanol as a fuel, but you know, you sort of have to really plan for that ahead of time. You can't just sort of throw in methanol after the fact and say, uh, "We'll just put another fuel pump in it." Like it, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. So it was going to be DI, and it was going to be methanol, and it was going to be uh, all-wheel drive. And that's about all the information I had at the time. There was no discussion about active suspension or, or any of this that sort of all folded out later when we started talking about that with the uh, guys who designed the chassis, which is Scarbo Performance, uh, specifically Joe Scarbo. We had a discussion, you know, a couple a month or two later about having this like hydraulic ram active control. And I told him, and I think the quote was, is, if you can design it mechanically, I can control it. Uh, okay. So we, we sort of went, went that way. And then yeah, it just sort of snowballed from there. 
All right, let's just pull back because there's a bunch of stuff now that I, I want to dive into, but let, let's pick off each of these topics individually. So let's start with that engine. So a GT3R from a 991 race car. So in, in stock form, these are naturally aspirated and uh, depending on balance of performance, are around about 550 horsepower, which clearly was never going to cut it to be competitive at the pointy end of Pike's Peak. So... You, you've got two turbos being fitted to this, and the power aim, if I'm correct, was 1400 horsepower. At sea level, the goal is 1400 horsepower, and the turbos that we were using from Garrett Motorsport specifically um, can move that much air to make that at sea level. And our target at the base was about a thousand horsepower, tapering down to about 800 at the top to uh, regulate turbo speed so we don't throw components out of it. Okay, and, and I mean, just briefly, for those who haven't really joined the dots here, Pikes Peak is uh, run at very high altitude with the, the peak being 14,000 odd feet. You've got very low barometric air pressure there, so essentially it's it's harder to, to make power. There's less oxygen for a given uh, volume of, of air, correct? So this is why you're sort of talking 1,400 at sea level, then at the base, which I can't remember, it's about 10,000 feet from memory? 9,000, yeah. 9,000, so yeah, uh, 1,000 there and then 14,000 feet at the peak, you're sort of down to 800, so I just want to clear that up for, for those who maybe haven't, haven't connected all of that. Okay, so... What do you do? I mean, obviously, I'll, I'll be clear here. You, you're not in charge of engine development, and I'm not expecting a deep dive. But just for for clarity, you know, you're not normally going to take a 550 horsepower naturally aspirated engine, bolt two turbos on it, run it on methanol, turn the wick up, and and call it good at 1400 horsepower. Is it safe to assume that there was some level of modification required to make this reliable power? Yeah, that's that's correct, but. Um so the, the high level view of the engine was essentially, um, uh, we replaced the pistons and rods, heads, head bolts, uh, excuse me, head studs, um, with units that PBI was more familiar with and knew that would take the power. I think the static compression ratio of a 991 G23R is approximately 14 to one or something quite high. Uh, so that was obviously not going to cut it. So, uh, we exchanged pistons, rods, head bolts. And we left the cylinder heads, cams, and valve train mostly the same, uh, with small tweaks, but nothing of, of really note. And okay. then we designed inlet and outlet manifolds to suit the turbochargers and intercoolers and methanol and extra injectors and such. Sure. Yeah, you just mentioned extra injectors, and this is another key with with methanol fuel in particular, well, even if we forget about methanol fuel, you're, you're not going to take a, a direct injector that will support 550 horsepower and, and manage that out to, to 1,400. And unfortunately, with direct injectors, our options are a little bit less broad than in the port injector world, given that we can't go to a, a range of manufacturers and just buy an off-the-shelf injector that's going to flow two or three times the fuel, correct? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, so this, the direct injector was the stock 991 G23R injector. And our only goal with that, the direct injection system was essentially for idle and drivability at low throttle. It, it doesn't do a lot except for maintenance fuel, if you want to think of it that way, um, below atmosphere. So it's okay. just sort of letting, letting the engine idle for drivability's sake and just sort of um, general manners. That does, on face value, seem like a lot of added complexity work and electronics requirement to maintain that direct injection system just for the sake of, of idle, as you mentioned. I mean, obviously, we can make an engine idle on methanol fuel on port injectors, and quite often when we see uh, a factory DI engine that is heavily modified at this point, it's still pretty common for the direct injection system completely to be removed and just go to, to port. Was that a consideration? And you know, if you're sort of toying with these two options, where was the advantage as you saw it and contain, continuing with that additional complexity when it's really just sort of a, an idle uh, ancillary device? That's a great question. Um, and the basic uh, point that it came down to was time. Uh, it is not acceptable to leave an injector in the cylinder head, just not spraying fuel. Uh, 
Uh, for us to do that correctly, we would have needed to plug the cylinder, plug the hole that the injector is currently sitting in and delete the pumps and the time frame that we needed to get the engine assembled in. That was not, it was not an option. Now, a few people have fallen into this trap of just leaving the direct injector fitted to block the hole because obviously as its name implies it is spraying fuel directly into the combustion chamber so it accesses the combustion chamber through the cylinder head so that's where the tip of the injector essentially is sitting and uh, yeah it it could be tempting to just leave that system there to block the hole and, and then go port injection but the direct injector actually requires fuel flowing through it to to cool it, correct? So there's a, there's a failure that will occur if you if you do what I've just explained. That's exactly right. It was it was our belief that the injector would turn into a glow plug, uh, and we would just basically it would be hot and sitting there in a pretty awful place in the combustion chamber. And honestly, because the goal of this system was to just have idle and drivability, this is almost easier to leave it and then have the complexity such that it's most of the work, most of the heavy lifting is done by the port injectors. So it's based on the time again, and not having enough time or resources to sort of delete the port, delete the direct injection correctly. Uh, it just seemed like sort of a no brainer to get a direction injection ECU and um, yep. control that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, that makes sense given what you've just explained, but at least as a cursory sort of, thought it does seem like it's almost a redundant system to have it there so th- thanks for, for giving us a, a full understanding there. Uh, now I also just a direct injection with aftermarket ECUs it is quite a complex task I mean first of all you need a specific type of ECU that is designed to control the direct injector uh, very very different from the strategy that a port injector is controlled but the other aspect is the as I understand it there is quite a lot that goes into actually calibrating essentially the the direct injection fuel pump and I'm not familiar with the GT3 R engine normally the the fuel pump, the direct injection fuel pump, is a mechanical device that's that's operated off a, a an extra lobe on a camshaft. Is that still the the case with the the GT3R? Yeah, that's exactly right. So this has two asynchronous pumps. There's one driven on each bank, so one high pressure bump per three direct injectors, uh, and it is driven off of the intake cam lobe. And there's a three lobe part of the cam that's used to drive the pump. And uh, I. Before we had the engine in the car, I was able to characterize that. Let, let's just talk about what that that means. I, I've tuned an, a number of direct injected engines on aftermarket ECUs, and I've I've always been fortunate enough that I'm starting from a base package that des- that is designed for that particular pump or or engine. So that kind of heavy lifting of of characterizing the pump, as you mentioned, that was always done for me. So my job becomes really simple. Uh, But having a a cursory understanding of of what goes into this is quite a a complex task. And if you don't get this right, you're going to have very poor control of your fuel pressure. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. What I was about to mention earlier is that characterization of the cam lobe is very important to understand how the pump works. For instance, what's the pump stroke? Take the pump apart and measure the bore so you can get uh, a sense of how much volume it can move per stroke. And that can be used as an input to the MoTeC ECU to control the synchronous pump. Yeah, so a lot of work ahead of time. So it's, it's one of those tasks where some physical work is required outside of actually just being on the dyno on, on the laptop, you're not going to be able to, if you if you didn't know, for example, the, the volume that the pump can flow for a stroke, you're not going to be able to just, well, you'd be very un, very lucky if you could just stumble upon the right, right numbers. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's true. Um, uh, I think that it's also possible to probably fat finger some numbers in there to get it working kind of well, but I don't think, I think you'll always be chasing your tail with the control loop of the fuel pressure system if you don't do that work ahead of time. Because you've got two two aspects of that as well. There is a, a spill valve to control the pressure essentially as a PID um, control algorithm that's incorporated into trying to control the fuel pressure. But you know, if you've got the wrong characterization for the fuel pump, you're going to be kind of trying to fix that or put a Band-Aid on it with the, the PID 
strategy, the PID uh, gains correct. So in order to get really good control and let the PID algorithm do what it's what it should be doing, you need those base values correct. Yeah, it's just like a boost control system. Um, you know, the more time you spend with your feed forward table, the, the better the PID result will be. Um, and there's, it's no different here uh, with the direct injection pump control. It's the more work you do ahead of time, the easier it is to get it straight, you know, after the engine's running. Yeah, again, obviously, as I mentioned, it's not something I've done with DI, but just when we're talking about a closed loop control strategy, you, you've mentioned boost control. I mean, idle speed control would be a, another obvious one. And time and time again, I, I see tuners getting poor results. And exactly as you mentioned there, they, they haven't really done the, the base feed forward or depending on the ECU brand, it'd be base duty cycle, for example. So if we're talking about boost control strategy, what we really want is before we try and actually add in any closed loop feedback, we want that boost to be as close to our target as we possibly can. And then we bring in our closed loop control and that means the closed loop's doing very little work and the whole system's just going to work really nicely rather than if you've got a massive error in your boost target and then try and fix that with the, the closed loop control. You sort of, you might get the result, but it's always going to be, it's always going to be sort of, flawed correct that's exactly right yeah i mean in any any classical controls system no matter what it is the more work you spend on that the better the result will be okay moving on to the rest of the fuel system so you've, you've mentioned port injection and you're, you're running two stages here of, of port injection can you talk us through the fuel injectors that you've used and and how you're staging in those secondary injectors or secondary and tertiary yeah that's a great question um and uh, to be clear, we are using two port injectors plus a DI injector per cylinder, but the two port injectors are not staged. They're wired together. So it's okay. one output from the ECU. Um, and choosing that injector was actually kind of a challenging thing because of the flow rate of methanol. So currently we are using two ID2600 XDS injectors per cylinder, uh, two, two of those port injectors per cylinder. It's a bit of a trade-off where... I didn't want to have to ask them. Those are too big for running methanol at the power we're targeting on the mountain. But the next size down would be the ID1700. And that would be too small for running the car at sea level at full power. So there's a bit of a trade off there in terms of the amount of outputs we had. We could not do secondary and tertiary injection. We had to do it as a staged pair. And I didn't want to have to ask them to change injectors if they run the car at sea level or if they run at the mountain. That seems sort of frivolous and stupid. So we just sort of dealt with a little bit of transient when the, when the port injectors come in. It's a, it, I, I don't think it's a big issue with drivability, but it's certainly a, a, a big step where they go from the non-response area and the dead time to starting to move fuel. It's kind of a big step, even with a good injector from injector dynamics. So ultimately, if you could get away with secondary and tertiary and bring them in independently, that would give you a lot more control and, and a lot smoother a, as you add that fuel. Yeah, that's that's correct. And um, this is probably sort of diverging a little bit, but Oscar, Zalea, and I, um, Oscar is, Zalea is uh, from Zalea Brothers. He was ex-Motec employees, super switched on, really, really smart young man. He and I worked together on this car to try to get it together, and he handled a lot of the engine calibration stuff with me. Uh, so it was nice to have someone to talk to about it. But we sort of had tossed the idea around of using uh, the second Motec ECU, which maybe we'll talk about later, and passing injection requests over CAN and use the injector drivers in the second ECU to drive a tertiary set of injectors so we would have three stages. But the reliability there, it just seemed too risky in the, again, in the time frame to implement something like that and make, to test it ahead of time to make sure we don't have, you know, any issues there. I, I can imagine on, on face value, everything you've just mentioned should be 100% feasible and, and should be able to be achieved in a rock solid format. But I think the key point, it, as you've mentioned, and we'll get back to is, is that time frame. I mean, for something like that, you would want to be able to put in the required testing to be absolutely guaranteed it's working as you'd expected. What I was interested just to talk about, I mean, obviously you, you've mentioned essentially the the two injectors that you're using, the two port injectors per cylinder, are probably a little bit bigger than than you ideally wanted. 
but these days you know you've got a range of options as well in terms of much larger capacity single injectors which we see on the likes of of pro mod engines so what i'm getting at here it wouldn't necessarily fix the issue in terms of getting a little bit less fuel flow for your port injector but in terms of uh, reducing complexity uh, was there any thought of using some of the sort of 500 pound per hour atomizer style injectors so you could get away with just one injector as a port injector instead of the two yeah absolutely um a lot of the billet atomizers that I had used uh, with two JZ drag cars in the past, uh, I had reliability issues with, and that's not to fault the injector, but it's just a sort of matter of debris getting in the injector or if it's a filtering issue. Um, I was just sort of a little gun shy about using those. And sometimes a lot of those are peak and hold, so low impedance injectors and we didn't have enough outputs in the ECU to do that with a single ECU and use atomizers. They had to be high impedance injectors like injector dynamics. Um, okay. And I, I just feel comfortable using ID stuff whenever possible. One thing I will mention is it, with the Motec M1 in particular and in, in you know, most of the current generation of volumetric efficiency based ECUs, it's a really a case of garbage in and garbage out. So to get your fuel model working properly, it really does require accurate injector characterization data. And injector dynamics do an exceptional job of providing that data. Uh, I do remember using a set of uh, billet atomizers in a methanol uh, super boat, uh, jet sprint boat. And that was back on M800. So characterization wasn't quite as critical anyway. But um, even getting solid information on dead time values at back then was was very difficult. So I, I imagine full characterization on the M1 might have been a, a little bit more challenging anyway. Yeah. And, you know, again, the, the sort of built-in support from MoTeC with Injector Dynamics products in general is so nice. Just comfort, reliability, again, short time frame stuff. Like now that we have more time, uh, with the car, I think there might be some architecture changes that happen before the next Pikes Peak event, but you know, time will still tell with that. All right, we, we've kind of gone off on a bit of a tangent, so I want to sort of get get this ship back on 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 uh, sort of the right track, and we'll go back to to the initial project. Uh, what what was the time frame when you you first got involved that you had to work with? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, there's, you know, the environment that we live in today uh, with supply shortages from Motec and Bosch and all the other vendors that we had on this project. I had to order components before we got money for the project. So there's a bit of a leap of faith in there that the project yeah. was actually going to get greenlit. Yeah, it was definitely a bit of a leap of faith. I mean, with the, the components that we use, it's all pretty top shelf stuff. So it was quite an outlay of money ahead of time. But I think the project officially started in maybe it was late February, March. Um, so quite late. Uh, it was to the point where I had to have a sit down with Batim and he felt the same way. Uh, Batim is the owner of BBI Autosport um, about this project when it was greenlit to say like, look, if this doesn't happen by, you know, this week, like we need to evaluate whether this is going to be possible to get this car together and built for testing in early June. Yeah, it, I mean, on face value, for those who haven't built a race car of any level, that does sound like a reasonable time frame, but it, it really isn't. And it is amazing as well, as you mentioned, particularly in the environment we currently are, are in with, with supply chain issues and delays on getting parts, the, the knock-on effect of, of one component being late and, and how that affects everything else. The, the other aspect here is when you first got involved and, and started your planning from from what I understand there was no car this was literally a digital concept at this point so h how do you design an electronics package and more specifically a wiring harness for uh, something that you can't see or touch that's a that's a great question and it was a is an immense challenge for this project um, so while the car didn't exist in reality it did exist basically fully formed uh, at least the chassis did, uh, exists fully formed in CAD. So the designer of the chassis, Joe Scarbo, uh, and I were exchanging CAD files back and forth. And I modeled up all the electronics that I was going to 
planning on putting in this car, which is a number of things. And I said, this real estate is open right now. I'm going to put them things here, 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 and here. And then I started basically drawing 3D sketches of where I thought the harnesses would needed to go. And that's, that's how it started. Obviously, it changed a lot throughout the process, but that was uh, an immense effort to, 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 to plan that without knowing for sure where things were going to live. Obviously, in the perfect world, particularly when you're planning a harness, what you're going to want to do is start by having all of the physical electronic components mounted in their final location. And then, or at least as I do it, I'll make a mock-up harness out of something like nylon rope, which I can kind of route in the same manner as my harness. and gives me a, a sense of where everything will fit best, more, most importantly, of course, the lengths of, of each of the branches, etc., uh, you didn't have this flexibility. So uh, are you designing your harness routing and, and the links again, just from, from CAD? Yeah, that's right. We had a 3D scan of the engine. We knew where the engine was going to live. We knew where the transmission was going to be. So I did the same thing that you just described. I just did it in 3D space instead of with a rope in the shop. Does that require a little bit of maybe leeway and what I mean by this are you purposely adding a little bit of additional length to some of your sections of harness so that you're not going to get caught short is, is that sort of how you're approaching this or it does it really work out pretty much on point I mean, obviously we're working from a CAD model it, it's going to be accurate <laughs> what's the saying is that it quote unquote fits in CAD <laughs> um, <laughs> so there was a little bit of that where I had to overestimate lengths and I made a couple of trips back and forth to their shop to, as they put things in, I would check that, you know, like does this thing that I might me- measured in CAD really exists in the real space in the car. And are there things that I didn't foresee or, you know, body panels were being designed in, in parallel with the chassis. So just because I had it routing through, you know, the, past the firewall, I didn't know where the fender liner was going to be. So, you know, it's something where I've got to like, once they get the fender liner in, I can look at it and be like, oh, wow, this is not going to work at all. (laughs) Um, So there's there's a lot of that. And uh, a real special honorable mention needs to go to KSV Looms. Uh, They are the, uh, Kevin from there is the manufacturer of the harness. And he and I worked together at length and he was super patient with me trying to say like, you know, giving him a pin to pin, you know, pin out sheet and lengths. And I'm saying like, look, I know you want this as like a, do- a build document that you can just nail through and get done, but uh, that information is currently unknowable. <laughs> so <laughs> it was, you know, it's like not, we'd have to, he sent stuff out flying lead and he's like, well, you can turn it on site. And then I, I had, you know, I had him come out for uh, a number of days to just sort of like, here's my design, you know, make it flying lead and then finish it in the shop. And he was just such a trooper and knocked it out, did a great job. So that that's a great solution when your links aren't maybe strictly locked down, just that flying lead. And for those who maybe aren't kind of following what that term means, just unterminated and, and maybe a little bit of additional length and then you can trim it to final length once you can actually see how it's going to sit and then pin it out into your connector bodies, correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. In terms of working with um, Kevin, is that because you don't build your own harnesses or was it a, again just a sort of a time frame issue to try and fast track everything so you could be doing something else while Kevin was manufacturing the harness? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of other uh, environmental variables with that, as I would call it. Um, I, I run a company here in California that's not motorsport related and there would have been no possible way that A, I could have done it in the time and B, that I would have done it half as well as Kevin would have done. So. There's, there's a time to do things, everything yourself. But if, if you meet someone that is exponentially better at it than you are and he's willing to work with you, uh, you should absolutely go with that person. And that's what I did for this project as I had Kevin on board and it was just immensely, immensely like a total lifesaver. Yeah. I, I think leveraging off other people with specific skills is, is something that, it is immensely important, particularly when you are working against a time frame like this. So it makes absolute perfect sense. 
In terms of the electronics package, we've obviously touched on a few of the components already with the twin M142 ECUs, but can, can you give us sort of a 30,000 foot view of, of the entire electronics package? Maybe we don't have enough time for that. I, I, I don't know. Give, a, give us the key components anyway. Yeah, sure. So yeah, as you mentioned, we're using two MoTeC M142 direct ingestion ECUs. One is for the engine, obviously, and then the other is for uh, a central logger chassis control, and then a general CAN gateway for um, being a sort of arbiter of data to go from one object or one module to another. Uh, we have a Bosch Motorsport PBX90, which is the power distribution module I chose for this project, Bosch Motorsport ABS M5, and Bosch Motorsport uh, WDA, which is their wiper module. Uh, it's LIN-based. It's kind of a fancy thing. Um, uh, race grade steering wheel, which has a Motec C125 in the center of it, and then a bunch of dials, an Obsidian Motorsport INS for traction control and other uh, uh, other sort of dynamics evaluation stuff. Those, those are the big ones. Okay, uh, again, a, a bunch of stuff to unpack in there. So uh, first of all, the two M142s, so you've mentioned you've got one for engine control and, and one, you probably won't hear this term too often for chassis control as well as the CAN gateway etc that you mentioned there. Uh, so yeah let, let's dive into that because that sounds like a, a somewhat unique use of a MoTeC M1 ECU. W- what do you mean when you say it's a chassis control ECU? Yeah so one of the unique design traits of this vehicle is that we have two hydraulic rams that change the leverage point of the front shocks and the leverage point of the rear shocks and this is to do active ride height control. So there's a, a hydraulic control valve, hydraulic pump lines, and uh, hydraulic rams to do actuation in the front and the rear ride height control. And that is controlled directly through a combination of uh, the chassis control and then the low level uh, power distribution and pulse width control of the valves is done through the Bosch Motorsport PBX90 to handle the high current stuff. Okay. So... Uh... Again, I think we probably need to sort of unpack this in a bit more detail as well. So uh, from what I've seen on on the chassis, it, it looks not too dissimilar to uh, most high downforce aero-based cars where you've got a damper for each corner of the car, but at each end of the car then you have a third damper and spring, often referred to as a heave damper or heave spring, which is helpful for reducing the tendency for the chassis to end up basically sliding down onto the ground at very high speeds where that downforce kicks in. So again, from my cursory sort of understanding or looking at, at the, the pictures of the car, it looks like you've essentially got a very similar setup, but instead of that heave damper, you've replaced that with uh, this hydraulic ram. Is that kind of about right or is there a bit more to it? Yeah, that's that's a good high level view of it. We are using that damper as a right head control and it sort of acts the same as a third spring, but not technically because each individual damper can't operate independent of the yoke that drives the rear, that drives the shocks. So it's calling it a third spring is kind of right, but it's also kind of not. But yeah, that's that's the rough idea. Okay, so I think we've got a, a bit of an understanding. Again, obviously, we don't have the benefit of pictures here. We'll, we'll chuck a link to the, the Hoonigan documentary in the show notes as well for people who haven't watched that already and, and want to sort of get a visual understanding of what we've been talking about. But to, to carry on here, you know, when you start sort of talking about active ride height, I mean, straight away my mind goes to the likes of you know the the Williams FW14B, which dominated everything with true active suspension. Mm-hmm. We're we're very different levels here, though, correct? Yeah, that's that's very true, and ours is a lot heavier <laughs> than anything that was in the Williams car. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a kind of a, a, a version zero of that system. And our, our objective here, the sort of high level goal of the ride height control was just essentially to be able to run the car very low at the bottom of Pikes Peak. And then as the road gets rougher towards the top, um, start bringing it up so we don't get into this sort of aero mitigation because the car is too low or skating over bumps and then obviously going off the road, which is not, not an option uh, at Pikes Peak. Ultimately, 
if you weren't to have the system on the car, you would have had to compromise the performance on the lower half of the mountain by running it higher. And you know, for for anything with such dr- dramatic underbody aero, the the effectiveness of that aero in terms of how much downforce it produces is very very sensitive to the ride height. Correct. That's exactly. So you right. want to run it essentially as, as low as you can. But as you mentioned, the top section very bumpy, so you'd end up bottoming and probably wiping out the diffuser and all sorts of other ugly, nasty things. That's exactly right. And the aero package on that car is designed by Varus Engineering. Um, Paul and Eric over there uh, did many, lots of CFD study on how high the car should be for effective aero, for it to be the most effective that it can be. And there's definitely a window that we were targeting there. And this is monitored by three lasers that we have mounted to the chassis of the car that are measuring the height off the ground. And so we're those lasers are not in the control loop for the system, but they're there to monitor it to make sure that we're adhering to our target right height. Okay. So in terms of the control strategy, you've got those three lasers basically giving you the, the height of the platform of the car as well as roll and heave, I assume. What's the actual control strategy for the hydraulic rams? Yeah, so we have linear potentiometers on the front on each shock, so it's four, and then we have two more, one on each ram. And since we know the kinematics of the system, we can target the control position of the ram. So the extended length of the ram is the control loop, and there's a PID that runs on the chassis ECU to pulse the valves such that the hydraulic system maintains a target ram length, which indirectly translates to ride height. How fast does does that system make a change? Like how quickly can it react? Yeah, that's a great, that's a really great question. Um, the control valves that we used uh, are inadequate for very high speed control because the pressure is so high. The transient response as we pulse the hydraulic control valve it can only pulse about 10 hertz, which is pretty inadequate for really sensitive control. And then the volume of fluid that the hydraulic pump can move is not a huge amount. So it's not like a industrial forklift, like that can, you know, swing a, swing a forklift really fast. So we get about, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but I would say probably an inch a second is not terribly unreasonable for rising. And then obviously we can go very fast going down because of gravity. Okay. Oh, that 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 does seem reasonably quick, but ten, 10 hertz is is definitely slow for something like that. But again, it's not really; it, it's very different to to the active suspension system from F one that I, I referred to earlier. And if I am correct, I think the the valves that they are using, because you mentioned the valve that you've got is inadequate, are, are a Moog valve used in F one, and and from what I understand, cringingly expensive to 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 buy. Correct. Yeah, and we, you know, this this car has definitely has a budget. It's not a blank check car, um, and we used a pretty, <laughs> I would say, it, the term is pretty agricultural uh, control valve. Um, so it's it's a big, heavy, giant industrial valve that no matter how fast you pulse it, it doesn't matter. Like you can watch the current trace and sort of interpolate valve position from looking at current, and it's just not fast acting whatsoever. So okay, but nevertheless, uh, effective for the task that that it was required to do. So uh, we've got an idea of the linear potentiometer giving position feedback to the ECU on on where the the hydraulic ram is, and then by pulsing this valve, you can get the ECU to essentially raise or, or lower the the platform of the car. How are you then deciding based on position on? the mountain when to lower it or what to be targeting is this related to ground speed is it related to time from or distance from the start line yeah g- give us give us some idea there yeah it's a bit it's a bit fancier than that since we have a pretty long history of data well not super long but we have enough data from previous years um, we know exactly uh, in GPS coordinates where the bumps are specifically and so we can have regions of bumpy areas of the track. There's a geo-referencing algorithm that runs in the chassis ECU to say when the car enters this bounding box zone, this is a high ride height zone. So the car would pick up and then as it exits the zone, it would lower back down if that's 
you know, the desired outcome. So this is a- actual 3D yeah, G-reference ride height control. Okay. So it's, n- it's not just a case of we get to this point, the car raises, and then that's it to the finish line. It's constantly changing based on the bumpiness of the, of the road. But it, yes, but again, it, it's 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 done that based on like a pre-existing map, if you will, or a feed-forward yep. value. It's not reactive because the system's not far, understood. far too You're slow. You're just telling it for for this particular part of the hill climb, we're running at this ride height, and once we're not in that area, it's at a different ride height. Yeah, I'm I'm interested. I've never had any experience with um, the geo referencing where you're using GPS coordinates or geofencing I, I guess would be another term for it uh, for a control strategy and I mean obviously you're, you're known for creating your your own sort of components for this as well which we talked to you about on the on the last podcast but is there how would I put it maybe uh, a inherent danger and an accuracy with that system and I'm not knocking the product. What I'm talking about here is it does depend a little bit on uh, the satellites available, satellites that are visible. Uh, so why we're, it's a long-winded question, but where I'm going with this is advantages of using geofencing for a control strategy versus particularly for a, a hill climb like Pikes Peak where you know where those areas are uh, versus the start line. Why use geofencing versus just distance from the start line? That's a phenomenal question. Really, really intelligent question. In fact, there's a lot of people that assume that GPS receivers are all the same, and they're very much not. And Pikes Peak is a great example in that certain parts of the track, there are sky view occlusions, uh, meaning that if you have a GPS antenna on the roof, say your normal Motec L10, for instance, uh, it's very possible that you will have periods of dropout where you would have to handle the sort of state machine problem of when I'm in this zone with the car up, but if you lose satellite coverage and, you know, the lat long position transitions to zero, zero or whatever, um, somewhere out in the Atlantic, uh, you know, what, what happens then? So the reason why we used my INS product in this car is that it's, it, it's robust to satellite outages where it will automatically transition from GPS plus IMU fusion to IMU only uh, pose interpolation to say that like it will continue producing lat long values, body velocity, acceleration, angular rate, uh, orientation, even without GPS for up to 45 seconds. And then the system would error out. Okay. So it, it's got enough sensor inputs that even without the GPS it can work off the last known good GPS fix and then using the other sensors that it, it incorporates it can essentially figure out what the GPS coordinates would be. That's that's what you're saying? Yeah, that's exactly right. And it does okay. it seamlessly. Like the driver would never know. You know, nobody would know except it produces the state information that says like, hey, the GPS is gone, but I'm going to continue producing all this data the same way it was before. And then when the GPS is reintroduced, the filter can handle it and then keep keep on about its day, which is really nice, especially up there. Perfect. Okay, I mean that that makes a lot of sense, and that gets me past my concerns over the the robustness of that data with GPS outages. However, then if we still com- compare that to just purely doing it off distance from start line, where's the the benefit then on the geofencing aspect? It's easier to co-locate the position. So say like. Well, I have data that says that, you know, well, latitude X and longitude Y, that there are uh, bumps in the road. Um, maybe there's like, it's a damaged piece of road. You can look in the data and see in like a log, you know, maybe there's uh, excessive Z acceleration to prove that there's a bump. So, you know, assuredly that, you know, the driver can say at this turn, you know, this left hairpin, there's a big bump here. You can actually take this lat long information, go into Google Earth or something, and actually make sure that this is the corner that the driver was talking about. Whereas if you had, you know, distance traveled based on wheel speed uh, or GPS distance traveled, it's harder to correlate and say like, well, maybe this was here, but maybe it was 100 meters earlier. And then this is totally ignoring the fact that if you're doing distance travel based on wheel speed, if you have a spin event, then you get slip and then the distance traveled number is useless anyway. 
I, I, as you were saying that, I was just thinking exactly that. A spin's really going to throw that out. I mean, I, I guess at the same by the same token, if you have a spin, probably your chances of a record or a PB might be gone anyway. But yeah, it's going to obviously throw throw the whole calculation out. Okay, yep, that that makes good sense. I've got a good sense of why why that system would be the the best way to go. Uh, in terms of the hydraulic ramps, obviously the, there's a there's a bunch of of product that goes into that. So you always got to balance the the performance benefit with the weight deficit. What was what first of all what is the weight deficit if if you're aware of it? What 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 are those components, the pump, the the rams, the actuators, etc. kind of weigh in the car? Yeah, I don't want to put a number on that because I don't want to tell you something that's not true, but I can tell you that it's heavier than we wanted it to be by a significant margin. Yeah. Um so if there is you know, we continue on with the system and we continue to use it. Uh, it will have to prove significant benefit um, beyond like, oh, that's neat. Like it raised up before some bumps and the car didn't skate off the track. The records that we're going after next year specifically, um, we need to hyper optimize for weight. And whether the system stays on the car in the future, we will have to have that discussion still. But it is it is expensive from a weight perspective. Definitely. Mm. And I'm guessing the other aspect with that is because of their location, at least those rams, they're actually mounted relatively high on the chassis, correct? That's right. And the ram is heavy, the fluid is heavy, and the lines are large. Like it, it, There's a whole lot of things that aren't super optimal for that system. So whether we redesign it in the future or ditch it entirely, you know, there is certainly precedent for uh, Seb Loeb. You know, it has the internal combustion record currently at well, low eight minute, I think eight thirteen or something. I think our unofficial goal is to try to take that. And I think that it's possible with that car, but he didn't need any sort of ride height control. So you could make the argument that maybe that's all dead weight and you don't need to have it. But one thing I will point out, and I have mentioned this in a in a uh, episode we did with Robin Shoot as well. So for those who are following it, it will sound like I'm repeating myself, but for those who haven't been to to Pikes Peak, it is just such a unique venue, and the problem, as I understood it, I can't remember who was telling me this, but th- they really, effectively, should not be sealing a road at that altitude, and it will always be problematic. And what we get is, you know, ice and snow, and then you get that snow melt, and the the moisture will then track underneath the tarmac, and then overnight it cools down and it freezes, and you get this this upheave, and essentially there's no combating that tarmac just shouldn't be at that sort of altitude because this will always be a problem so again just from what I understand uh, Sebastian Loeb had the advantage unplanned I don't know of when he ran I believe that the top section of the mountain had just been freshly sealed so he had the benefit of essentially running on on nice smooth tarmac and obviously that changes from from year to year. So I mean, it's it's a moving target, correct? We're not kind of it's not a fair fight, is what I'm saying. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And again, it, it's it's a function of we need to do further testing to see whether it's worth the weight cost. Honestly, that like as as the guy that sort of co-designed this system um, with Joe Scarbo uh, and BBI, I don't want it to go away. Like it's very close to my heart, but. You know, ultimately, I, I also understand the realities of, of weight. Losing weight is very important. Absolutely. Uh, I'm interested, was there any simulation or validation work done virtually on the pros and cons, the, the weight versus the, the perceived benefit on the bumpier sections? Or was it a case of doing that in the real world, which obviously didn't quite happen? Yeah. So there was lots of simulation done from the impact of aero and losing ride height and like what is the best ride height but in terms of like vehicle weight versus performance no there was nothing done we were just going to evaluate it on the hill okay yeah fair enough let's get back to the rest of the electronics package and you've you've mentioned there that chassis control ecu was also sort of a, a a can gateway and did you say central central logging hub as well yeah that's right so all of the chassis data from every module um, well, all the data from everything in the car is all logged in the chassis ECU, uh, which includes the engine data. You're pulling data from one place. So the only time you should ever have to pull data from the engine ECU is if there's a drivability problem or something. 
Okay. I'm interested on your take. I mean, you've really answered the question because of the way you've gone about that. But when we are designing a, a logging system for a vehicle that's complex like this, you've, you've generally got one of three solutions as I see it. Uh, one would be to use the driver display. In this case, uh, was it a 125 or a 127 in that uh, race grade steering wheel? I can't quite remember. Yeah, it's a C125. C125. So that has logging capability. So obviously you can run sensors into the C125 dash, but you can also send your data via CAN. So that's one option. Use your your dash or driver display as a central logging hub. The other is the ECU, but sometimes it can be difficult. That's great for uh, engine data, uh, paddle shift, etc. But sometimes it can be difficult to, to integrate the rest of the data that you want. Or the third option is a... Uh, there are devices that are designed as a central logging hub. So I'm interested why why you've gone that route rather than using the the likes of the the driver dash display as the logging hub. That's a phenomenal question. Again, um, this Motec dashes uh, the compute power is not enough. Is the short answer. If you record lots of high frequency data um, from many channels, there is. A limitation that you'll run into very quickly with Motec dashes, um, which is why they had made the ACL and sort of previous central loggers. We could have used an advanced dash as a logger, so the ADL3 or the C18 dashes. But when you're integrating uh, lots of different information from lots of different vendors, there isn't always a DPC available to do sort of quick uh, data import into a dash. So it made more sense for me because I'm very comfortable in Motec M1 build to build that as a central logger where I have three CAN buses. I've got, you know, relatively abundant compute for that type of thing. So it was just sort of a logical move in my eyes. That's a, a good segue into build. And again, this is a topic that's come up a, a handful of times so far in, in our podcast. But essentially, the, the short story is here, the Motec firm, yeah, the the hardware itself is is just essentially a, a black box and then with build you can make your own firmware to essentially do as you wish with it up to your imagination essentially obviously and the limitations of the electronics so uh, are you using any production motec firmware for obviously the chassis side of things has got to be custom but is, is it production firmware for the engine and paddle shift control or is everything bespoke that you've you've developed so i can answer that in two phases the chassis ECU, the build project has no relation to MoTeC firmware. It is from scratch. Uh, but that being said, when you use build, you're, you're sort of using snippets of code that MoTeC has written to receive low level sensor information like analog inputs, digital signals, et cetera. Uh, and then you're customizing that for the need that you have. So if you have used build before, I basically took an empty build project and started populating my own receives from the PDM, which is really complex. All of the Obsidian INS is, is a pretty heavy receive because it's very high rate, high precision data stuff from the engine ECU stuff from the dash states and things from the steering wheel. <clears throat> and then that was just more comfortable for me to do that. And then with on the engine ECU, we initially started out, we were planning on using Motex GPRP DI. That's a direct injected paddle shift firmware that's stock. However, we quickly ran into some bottlenecks with that with regards to compute CPU load. Uh, because the engine is relatively complex, we, we would not have been able to use GPRP DI in its stock form. And that the transmission we were using, which is a SATEV SL90, uh, has a half shift neutral which means that it's like a motorcycle where when you go from first, it's not a full stroke down to neutral and then a full stroke down to reverse. It's a half stroke in a neutral and then a half stroke in the reverse. So that is absolutely not supported with Motex GPRP DI uh, firmware. So that, that's actually problematic with a lot of ECUs that half shift, which fortunately, at least in the uh, the car world, is not a common uh, type of sequential gearbox. But um, as you mentioned, pretty much anyone who's uh, who's been riding motorcycles, that's that's the sort of common location for neutral. So it struck me as a little bit odd, but but it is what it <laughs> is. Yep. So so you are essentially your hand was forced there to make your own custom firmware. 
because of that transmission as well as the the fact you are sort of striking this sort of uh, CPU usage limitation. Yeah, and there were a couple of other subtle details that uh, a number of other small details that were improved by the custom firmware from Zalea Brothers. Um, Oscar specifically uh, handled a lot of that basically straight out of the gate, and we were able to fix some just obvious bugs that are in the Motec GP firmware. I think you know having the flexibility as well to to have a, a function work exactly how you want. Uh, is really nice. I mean, everyone's always got their own ideas on on how best to to run a particular function or feature, and you've just got that total flexibility. So if you've got the ability, the capability to to write uh, the code, then then absolutely why not? Uh, and in terms of driver control, so you've got that race grade steering wheel we've already talked about with the C125 dash. So that's acting as just a pure driver display, and obviously the the paddles there for upshift and, and downshift. Um, there's quite an array of different switches or rotary dials on that race grade steering wheel as well. So how much control are you giving the driver over different functionality or you know, is, is less more or is this something that maybe would have come with more time and development once, once you sort of figured out the, the flexibility that Ken Block wanted? Yeah, um, obviously that's a, that's a driver by driver discussion, but the main state and the state control that we gave him was uh, there's six rotary knobs on that steering wheel there's two in the thumbs and four in the center the thumb knobs were basically for screen brightness and then wiper speed um, because the, it has a mono wiper in the center uh, and then the four main rotary pots are anti-lag intensity abs intervention amount traction control and then throttle mapping so for throttle sensitivity stuff. So he's got the ability to control that throttle sensitivity or throttle mapping on the fly to to get it feeling how he wants the the sort of level of response he he's used to or, or familiar with. Mm-hmm. And then anti lag obviously is another thing that's very driver dependent. I forgot to mention earlier actually that the chassis ECU, we have the small drive by wire bypass valves that are controlled by the chassis ECU that are mounted on the intercooler for uh, anti surge and then anti-lag, uh, sort of aiding anti-lag. Uh, so by that, are you meaning this is a fresh air anti-lag system where those drive-by-wire motors are use it, being used to introduce air directly into the exhaust manifolds? Uh, no, we didn't have the, the space to do like a proper fresh air, but we are using it to bleed off boost pressure to allow the turbos to spin up, but it doesn't inject air into the intake, okay. or excuse me, exhaust manifolds or anything. So I take it on that note that that surge potentially is is a real issue with the the turbo sizing on that particular engine without those. Yeah, exactly. Um, the turbo sizing for that, not to diverge. I'm sorry if I'm driving you all over the place here. That's okay. Um, but the turbo sizing on that car is is relatively unique because the reason why we use the turbos that we did, which are these very very trick air motorsport ones that are very very light. They're like less than five kilograms a piece. Um, so quite light for a turbo of that size. They have a relatively bad transient response if you do not use any lag, but they work perfectly well between 7,000 and 9,000 RPM where there's no sort of surge or any sort of undesirable effects. And when coupled with the any lag system, it's fairly responsive for how large those turbos are. Sure. And, and response as well, I've, I've found this firsthand, uh, an, an area that I didn't really maybe anticipate, and in hindsight might make sense. You, you take a, a turbo package that's working really well and nice and responsive at, at sea level, and you get to the start line at Pikes Peak and all of a sudden the boost threshold's moved up and, and the response is just turns to shit, correct? That's exactly right. And especially what's unique about Pikes Peak is the, the Ws, which are just after Glen Cove, about... Uh, I don't know, three quarters of the way up, halfway up. You're in a very low RPM in first gear. Um, for instance, you're about 25 miles an hour. Like if you're cooking around some of those corners, and we we actually wound up regearing the transmission to sort of better help that area after the second or third test. And even after regearing it, you know, we're getting down to it's about 4,000 RPM in first gear, uh, which is that's pretty low for a, a car that's at altitude with turbos at large. So we have to rely on the anti-lag pretty heavy there. 
the downside with with anti lag though is it does generate a huge amount of heat. I mean, in in general, at least in my experience, it's pretty nasty on most of the components on the hot side of the engine. Um, mm-hmm. No doubt effective, but when cooling is often an issue at Pike's Peak at the best of times, was this problematic? Was it something you you needed to monitor and bring into a control strategy so that you know you could dial back the anti lag if temperature became an issue? Uh, or did you just not get far enough to to figure out how how much of a problem that could have been? Yeah, I'm really happy to report that was one of the shining successes of that that whole trip um, was that our decision to use methanol helped the exhaust temperature engine cooling just immensely, you know, as you would expect. But I didn't expect it to be as much as it was um, when towards the end before the failure, you were running about 80% power. And we had maximum EGTs in 700C range. So like quite cool um, and quite a bit cooler than what we had been running the previous year with E85. Um, E85, we were seeing around, uh, I'd say, 850, 850C, um, you know, at, at its hottest. And uh, even with the anti-lag on just sort of ludicrous amount of ignition retard, like it was just sort of irrelevant, more or less. The engineer that we worked with at Garrett Motorsport is named Kurt, and he and I talked at length about the sort of design requirements of this turbo for this engine package. And we did an engine simulation to try to size the turbo correctly. And he basically said, these will run at 850C all day long, like no problem at all. So as long as you stay below that for any extended period of time, that's fine. And then 900C is probably the the upper limit of where you want to stay for any extended period of time. Yeah, okay, okay. Now, one of the things you mentioned there with those Garrett Motorsport turbos, which is really unique, and I hate to think what the price tag that goes along, along with one of them is, is the weight. I think you said 5kgs, and as you mentioned, for a, for a big turbo that's incredibly light, and for those who aren't familiar with that turbo, the, those Garrett Motorsport turbos are quite unique in that they don't have to go through uh, burst containment testing so physically the, the housings are, I think from memory the compressor cover is magnesium as well to to reduce weight instead of alloy uh, I, I hope I've got that correct but basically much much thinner than what we're used to in the automotive performance world of Garrett's usual range of, of turbochargers because they don't need to pass this burst containment so that that's one of the reasons why they can get the, the weight down so far which obviously in, in a performance application is, is critical. That's exactly right and we had to you know I had to talk to Kurt at length and you know assure him that I am cognizant of what can happen if you overspeed a turbo at a high altitude environment and I showed him proof from last year that I had a turbo speed control strategy that kept maximum, you know, below a safe margin with the G3900s that we had, Garrett G3900s that we had used the previous year. So I think he, he felt comfortable after a little bit of talking him down about not selling us those turbos. So um, it was it was a good thing. Let's move on to testing. And again, you've got this very compressed time frame and in a perfect world, particularly with, with such a, a completely unique ground up build where every single component is custom, there's going to be a fairly long and drawn out testing process involved before you would take it to uh, the first event. Now, obviously you're sort of limited by this time frame and, and, and that is what it is. So what was the testing strategy that you were you were sort of intending to go with? How much testing did you get or should you have gotten before you actually went to Pikes Peak? I don't remember off the top of my head, but the first test that we did was I think early June, but we had we had we were planning to try to test as as early as mid April, but there was just no possible way with the timeline that we had. So we got far less testing than we wanted by an order of magnitude. Uh, this was another car uh, that I had mentioned last time we spoke that we did not go in the dyno before it ran. This was more of this like trackside, trackside efficiency tuning and setup where we just basically had to get it idling and you know got it revving around on the air jacks, and then we had to take it to the track and make it make it do things. So the the first video that Hoonigan released was. Uh, just simply where Ken's, I think Ken or Batim is driving it around just at 
this ungodly slow pace. Like that is the first time that that car had ever ran, period. Okay, so that is your uh, quote unquote dyno tuning. And I, yeah. I did wonder watching that. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, they, they mentioned that essentially it was almost run naturally aspirated to start with with a, a much reduced throttle opening so this is just giving you some data points to sort of get the mapping at least in the ballpark yeah that's right and at the time we were actually using the turbo smart uh straight gate electronic gates but those did not live in our environment unfortunately so we had to exchange those but the advantage we had at the time is that you can crack those all the way open and you can whack it as hard as you want it won't make any boost whatsoever Interesting. Uh, just a little bit off topic, but the straight gate failure there was that that an aspect of the the heat and that design of of wastegate compared to a conventional poppet style wastegate. Uh, no, it was certainly nothing on TurboSmart, and I don't want anybody listening to this to think that I'm I'm just sitting here talking shit about TurboSmart because it's Absolutely. a cool product. Um, but the downside of having an aero car like we had is that there is no air that passes over anything down there so the way we had planned for the wastegates to go they were very close to the manifold and even though our egts were quite low you know in the, in the absolute sense or the relative sense um the ambient temperature in the engine bay was very very high and even with water cooling we were we were north of 150 c at the control unit and what would happen is the servo would basically park itself and then not be able to move anymore uh we went through two of those so we opted to remove those and use just old school pneumatic gates after that yeah okay that makes sense i i assume you you kind of in terms of tuning this thing obviously the methanol is is one aspect that you got to get on top of but i'm assuming in terms of ignition timing you're going to have a at least some idea from the other BBI projects you've been involved with. At least I'm, I'm guessing you, you could put in pretty much put a, a timing map in it and be there or thereabouts from the get go. Yeah, that's right. And that's exactly how it went. Uh, again, Oscar was handling most of that. And um, I sort of gave him what I thought was best advice in terms of MBT for that engine. And it was, it was fine. I mean, you're not in any way near any type of detonation window with the timing that we were running and the fuel that we were running so it was sort of a pretty low stress thing and that way we can as long as we i mean we made sure that obviously the reference offsets and stuff were correct so that the timing value we put in the map was accurate but ultimately the number in the table kind of didn't matter as long as it ran well it was sort of okay that that's one of the benefits with methanol i mean within within reason you you're not going to be knock limited uh, and your, your only danger there is being beyond the MBT, in which case you're not going to necessarily hurt the engine. It's just not going to make as much torque as it potentially could. But you know, there's there's the sort of if you ever anyone's ever seen that sort of uh, spark sweep test where you hold the engine at a constant point and advance the timing from a very low starting point, you know, maybe five degrees through to 50 degrees you sort of see this ramp up and torque and then once you get around that mbt point you've got this quite wide plateau that might be as, as sort of wide as maybe 10 or 12 degrees where the torque doesn't really change so i mean if you can get yourself there and you're not knock limited you're going to be there or thereabouts so the, the timing's probably not so critical as maybe a gasoline based fuel where you would be worried about knock yeah that's at least been my experience i mean i in, in the methanol projects I've been a part of in the past, it's just so friendly. I think it's that's a pretty low stress thing, where it's not like uh, you're you're trying to optimize power in a you know restricted uh, rally car or like uh, gasoline pump gas whatever. Now, in terms of that tuning as well, having no dyno time, I'm guessing you've also got the benefit of as long as your fueling is at least sort of. You can see the ballpark from where you are. The the closed loop control of the fueling is there to sort of pick up the pieces. So if you're off target, that's going to fix it. I mean, obviously it's not a band aid. You don't want to run the car like that. But you've then got some data to to look at. You can see what your closed loop trims were, and then kind of apply that back into the VE table to correct that. So quite quite a quick iterative process of at least getting your fueling dialed in. Yeah, that's exactly right, and that's that's certainly how anybody that's sensible would do it. 
It's just the trouble of doing that at the track is that the update frequency is so low. And what I mean by that is just, you know, you would drive around in a dyno and just sort of flooring it as you wish, or just hitting transient areas that you want to touch. And you get to quickly update your map very fast and building a, an accurate VE table is very simple. But if you have to wait for an entire lap at a time, you know, it's just so slow. And that that's really the big, the big downside of trying to do what we did at the track. I'm guessing the other thing is that you've got this multiplied by sort of 10 other different aspects that you're also trying to dial in, suspension, ride height, aero balance, I, you know, I'm, I'm just guessing here, but you know, yeah. so much going on. I'm interested like when the car actually hit the track for the first time and once you sort of got this tune dialed in and Ken could, could lean on it a little bit, did, did it broadly work out as intended or were there some completely unforeseen curveballs that you had to deal with? Um, actually, from an engine and systems reliability perspective, once we were actually able to run it at power and we fixed this weight skate issue that I talked about earlier, um, and we could actually make reliable boost. We found that the big thing we had to change that was unexpected was the gear ratio. Um, the car was geared quite long for what we needed. I think the top speed would have been a 170 something, which is above where we needed to be for bike speed. We sort of anticipated a max speed around 150 or 160 if everything was right. That was really the big systematic change. But in terms of fueling, uh, ignition stuff, sort of general boost control stuff after the pneumatic gates were put on, it was all just sort of basic system setup stuff. Nothing like no major roadblocks of like, oh, we need to add another fuel pump. We had 1500 liters per hour of fuel from three brushless pumps, two pumps for the port injectors and one pump for the DI injector. You know, all that stuff just sort of worked great. Um, Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And there's speed control, which is done through the chassis ECU also based on fuel requests from the engine ECU. So it was like minimizing fuel heating and like everything just kind of worked. It was really refreshing amongst all the sort of terror and panic that was with that car. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, when you don't just randomly sort of pick parts off eBay and assemble them into a project and hope for the best, when you're actually doing it in an intelligent, systematic approach with an understanding of the requirements of each component, you would like to think that would be the result that you would experience. But but of course, it, it isn't always that way. And, and Murphy's Law, generally, when you're fighting a tight time frame, that's when you're going to come up against some unforeseen problems. So at least as far as that goes up to this point, that wasn't the case, which is, is great. Uh, I mean, broadly here, we've been talking about engine and, and electronics, but what, was there anything else that sort of came up in terms of how the car actually handled and performed? Because I mean, it's one thing to make 1,400 horsepower or 1,000 horsepower or whatever mm. it is, but you, you can also have that in an evil handling car that, that the driver just can't get around a track, which makes it next to useless. Uh, we saw in, in some of the early testing videos, Ken seemed to have a bit of trouble with uh, snap oversteer. So was, was there any sort of dramatic changes that were required in terms of the suspension setup? Yeah, so early on, we had set up the chassis to be soft and compliant. And the idea there was to be compliant over the bumps at the top. Like that was sort of our North Star metric of what we were trying to gain time on. Because the, the bottom is kind of a drag race. Like we won't, we wouldn't have much for Robin down there because his car is so light. Yeah, maybe we would, but you know, like that, that's not where we're going to make the time. Um, so we were really trying to like emphasize and go after the upper sections, which are quite bumpy. That wound up being uh, a little bit problematic um, at the track that we tested at, which you can see in the video is uh, Pueblo Motorsport Park, which is like south of Colorado Springs by about an hour. That's a pretty fast, flat track without a lot of elevation. And uh, Ken wasn't particularly thrilled with the chassis at that point. Uh, so the Tim decided to go back to what he's comfortable with, which is BBI is super, super, super good at setting up uh, water cooled, you know, and air cooled 911s. And we just put more camber in it by a pretty significant margin and doubled the spring rate. And it was night and day better. Yeah. So it was a big swing and he was way happier with it, but we still weren't all the way there. And that potentially could have backfired on, on the bumpier sections of the hill as well. Or were you confident that that was still going to probably be workable? 
we were confident that it was still going to be workable, but at the same time, we didn't get to test after the spring rate because of the engine failure. We didn't get to test at the top after this with, with the new yeah. spring rate because of the engine failure at the end there. All right. Well, that that's obviously the elephant in the room. So, so since you've mentioned it, let, let's dive into this. I mean, it's pretty well publicly known at this point that um, the car didn't make it to, to race day, which is a huge shame. I, I definitely yeah. was looking forward to seeing what the car and, and Ken could do. So engine failure, which is kind of the, the worst case scenario, sort of rolling the thing up into a ball. How, mm-hmm. how did it go down? What, what actually happened and what was the sort of uh, the failure analysis in the end? The high level view at this point is that the valve spring rate was too low for the engine speed that we were targeting. And without going into like the ultra fine details of that, we still need to do sort of a really in-depth postmortem as to why exactly that happened. But that is the operating theory at this point that okay. we had a valve float event that didn't end favorably. Valve float, in my limited experience with it, doesn't normally end favourably. So if we can stay away from it, um, then yeah, happy days. Definitely, definitely don't want that going on. What what sort of RPM are we talking about with this engine? Yeah, so we were shifting that north of nine thousand RPM, and that was a design requirement of using those turbos because they are so large that the effective power band of the turbo at altitude is basically sixty five hundred to nine thousand. Yeah, okay, and we were pushing it a bit north of that, you know, when we started to have, we had an issue, that's the short answer. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, that, that does seem like a, a sensible angle to be be looking at. So, valve float, for, for those who maybe haven't heard that term before, essentially you, you lose control of the valve. It's no longer contacting, in this case, it's a finger follower arrangement, I, I believe you said? That's correct. It is a finger follower for that cylinder head. All right, so so we lose contact there, so the valve is now literally floating, so you've then got the danger, um, particularly if it's the exhaust valve and the, the piston's kind of chasing the exhaust valve closed, so quite often the, the piston will tag the exhaust valve if it's floating and doesn't too, normally take too much of, of that to end up breaking the head off and, and again, yeah, as soon as you've got a, a bit of valve head floating around in there, uh, it gets pretty ugly pretty quick. Uh, Obviously, it was a terminal. The other ash, a issue here is obviously you, you, you're dealing with a team that is very well funded and a very public project. I imagine they moved heaven and earth to try and get that car uh, fixed and, and back on the mountain. But uh, sometimes it's not that easy. What, what were the sort of stumbling blocks on sourcing uh, replacement components to actually get back up and running? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that. Um, I told myself that I would never read any YouTube comments that are related around this car, but I, I made the, the fatal mistake of doing that. And to answer the, the populace, why didn't you have a spare engine was the resounding question. And it is not a, it's the engine, not having a spare engine is not a function of money. It is a function of availability. And we could not get available parts to build two engines for that car. We only had one. So, that's my asterisk to that comment, just to be clear. But we did absolutely move heaven and earth to try to get this thing fixed. And for those that are not familiar with Pikes Peak and the timelines, uh, you know, the testing starts like we're, we're up at 2.30 in the morning to be on the hill ready to drive at like 5, you know, 5.30 or something. So we're done. You know, the day is over at 10 o'clock in the morning. And so after we had the failure, we're like, okay. What is the worst case scenario here? Like, what do we need to do if we assume absolutely everything is just totally toast? So we flew in uh, the engine builder, who's just a a lovely human, uh, and he checked a cylinder head, an assembled cylinder head with him that was slated for another project. You know, he's like taking the next flight out of LA to go to Colorado to get there at one o'clock in the morning to put a cylinder head on it to try to make the test in a few hours like that that's the sort of like insanity that is surrounded by that race so we found a cylinder head we found a piston these were custom pistons cp cut us a piston for this for this hole in an hour wow like that just does not happen like cp is a job shop they're they're, excuse me they're not a job shop it's a production house like things like that don't happen garrett motorsport had made spares for us i mean well i should i should be clear 
they made spares of our turbo if other people wanted to use it in, in the motorsport land. So they actually happened to have an assembled center section that was balanced and ready to go that they could put on, you know, UPS red or whatever for us to arrive at the morning. Now, that turbo aspect there, and people listening might be wondering, well, what's the oh, turbo sorry. got to do with that? I, I, yeah. I can only assume that that valve head probably made its way out at, once it had destroyed the piston and the cylinder head and then went out and destroyed the turbine wheel as well just to add uh, insult to injury. Is, is that what happened? Yeah, if anybody is so wanting, there are probably parts of Ken Block's motor on the side of Pikes Peak Highway <laughs> right now <laughs> if you want to find a valve stem somewhere. Um, the, the head of the valve was thankfully stuck in the valve seat, but there, there are, there are some parts that made it, made it through that turbo and it wiped it out pretty good. Uh, just coming back to something you said before as well, just about, you know, going through a thorough analysis of this. And, and this is something that I, I think is really important at, at just about any level. I mean, engine failures, no matter how careful we are, no matter who's involved, what level we're working at, I mean, they are uh, sadly a, a kind of a fact that we have come up occasionally and we do need to deal with and and I think that the most important thing is always to spend the time and and, and properly understand the failure mode and and that also particularly with a catastrophic failure uh, can can be easier said than done I mean if you've got a, a rod that goes out through the side of the block at 10,000 rpm you know th- there's often not a lot left to analyze but within we're humanly possible within reason we, we want to make sure that we understand exactly what went wrong and why that's important is if we don't get that proper understanding and fix the the root cause of the problem we kind of set ourselves up for an expensive failure where it's just going to happen again. So, you know, I, I just wanted to circle back to that uh, so people can kind of keep that in mind because at all levels this is this is something I see people failing to do and, and it just, yeah, there's, there's nothing worse than having the same failure happen a, a second time around. So obviously not the way Pike's Peak was intended to go for you guys and, and it, it's a crying shame uh, that it that it did end in this way but sometimes these things do happen like we'll, we'll move towards wrapping this up because I've sort of I've changed around my, my three final questions we've already had you on the podcast as we've mentioned so there's no point asking the same questions the, the first of these questions is now what's what's next on the agenda for the Huna Pegasus What's going to change? Is it going to come back for 2023? Uh, what have you learned from the testing that it did do and what needs to be changed? And I guess most importantly, just to chuck a whole bunch of questions your way in one <laughs> shot, uh, is the outright title, is the uh, Romain Dumas IDR Volkswagen electric title within reach? Or are we? is that maybe just a, a too, too much of a stretch? Andre, man, so many questions. I'll try to try to nail all of them. <laughs> um, yeah, so the the team is committed to 2023 by speed. So we will be there for the 101st running. <clears throat> In terms of like significant design changes, I'm happy to report that I don't think there will be major like architectural changes. I think that we will keep most of the electronics the same. I'm actually flying down to BBI Autosport this weekend to sort of make a plan of attack for this year and leading up to the next year. I think we've got all the bare components there. The big one, at least for me personally, up in there, this is, and I haven't spoken with BBI about this or Scarbo. I don't know if the suspension stuff will stay on there because of this discussion we had earlier about weight versus benefit. I think it should, but again, you know, I'm, that's, that's, that's like my child. I'm like too close to that to make an objective decision. So you got a bit of a dog in the fight there. Yeah, I've got lots of dogs in this fight, but you know, ultimately, I think it will remain mostly the same. The big things that'll be sort of items to address this year will be just sort of detail oriented stuff that we had to we had to blow through to get it done. Center diff would probably be one. Sadov makes a nice electronic center diff that's like not super large that they use on the unicorn for big skids and stuff. Um, so that, that'll help, I think, drivability and turn in a little bit, or we can disconnect the front and rear diff on turn in. And it's easy for us to do a control algorithm on that because we have all the dynamic sensors we would need to do that effectively. Your question about Romain's, uh, IDR record. I am the least optimistic, most pessimistic person you'll probably ever talk to given the power that we'll make and the, what the car weighs. 
what I would like to have is a relatively attainable goal that I think we can actually hit is uh, Seb Loeb's internal combustion record. And, you know, I'm sure Robin, Robin will be bringing some major heat. I've never spoken with Robin personally, but Motorsports Electronics, Tim and Zach, I, I I'm friendly with those guys. They're real nice. Uh, and I know, I know that they'll, they'll bring a serious car next year for sure. Yeah. I mean, we, we've just had Robin on the podcast and um, got, got pretty deep into it. I mean, that, that is a smart team and they have the benefit of a, a very lightweight car and clearly also a, a hunger to claim that outright record. Uh, albeit they, they probably have somewhere around about half the power that, uh, the Hoonapig has so you know that's it's there's so many variables in here and at the end mm-hmm. of the day uh the the weather also plays a, a big role so it's anyone's guess but it, it will be will be great to see how it goes with a, a decent crack at it hopefully with a more reliable engine yep next question sander and, and this again is a slight uh change to to what i normally ask but is there any advice you would give to others that are currently out there working professionally in the industry, so be it tuners or harness builders or anything of that nature, uh, to to start getting noticed and maybe claiming some of the higher profile jobs like you've managed to do with BBI? Um, you know, I'm, I'm guessing there's a lot of jealous people watching these documentaries going, God damn it! I wish I wish I had these opportunities. I could have really had a had a decent crack at that. Yeah, there's, there's two aspects to that question, and I want to address that really quickly just by saying that what you see on documentaries like the one, the really nice one that Hoonigans recently put up, it is like an iceberg. You just see this much, right? Or I'm sorry, I'm I'm, I'm looking into a camera. I'm making a very small uh, uh, a distance between my thumb and forefinger for those that are listening. But you, you really don't see the whole story. Um, it, it is not all glamour. There are countless, countless nights where, you know, it, it is a big budget car. There's no way to cover that up. But I build for probably way less time than I should have on that project in terms of just design and thought time and engineering and being on site. And, you know, like I got paid for it. But at the same time, like it wasn't like the money was almost irrelevant, to be honest, because the, the project. I think has enough sort of long-term significance that I was going to do it no matter what. And I think that if I were to give anybody any advice on like how to be working on projects like this, it is to fully commit. There's just no other way to do it. How do you get exposure is a question, but if my sort of public media presence in terms of my posts I make on Instagram or Facebook uh, at my company page, I just, I'm really passionate about certain control things and learning new stuff and experimenting and sort of going after theories that I have. And, you know, if you think of something neat, like go after it. And if it's turns out to be something cool, like tell people what is completely holds no value in my mind is putting up pictures of hardware you bought. Like nobody gives a fuck about that. <laughs> you know, it's just, it just do something cool with it. You know, like don't, uh, and maybe that's maybe that's too harsh. I, I don't know, but <laughs> no, I, I think I think you're onto something there. But I think that that the angle, and this is so hard, uh, particularly for smaller operators, is the social media aspect. I think, you know, and ultimately, social media is how you and I ended up meeting, yeah. and you know, build a relationship from there. But you know, I I, I saw what you were doing, and it's very clear straight away uh, to me. I've got a reasonable idea of, of a lot of things in this industry, but it's very clear from the post you're putting up that you're just operating it just a whole nother level. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that others, the likes of, of BBI, would have seen that as well. So, I mean, I think, mm-hmm. you know, taking the time to, to sort of wrap this up into a, into a, put a little bow around it is, you know, yeah, you've got to you've got to put yourself out there to to show what you're doing. Um, you know, obviously, if you are working at a high level, that that's the, <laughs> that sort of goes without saying. Yeah, yeah. And, and and it's also about growing that network, which sort of comes hand in hand with social media these days. And I mean, there's pros and cons, obviously, with social media, but I think that that can be so pivotal to getting your exposure out there and in front of the the right people to get these jobs. The other thing I will mention, 
and you sort of alluded to this anyway, is sometimes this can be a bit challenging because obviously you've got to put food on the table, you've got to earn a living. There are some jobs sometimes where maybe you you need to also factor in taking a bit of a hit on on the actual hourly rate or being able to charge all of your hours because it's a uh, you know one of those unicorn projects where you're going to get the exposure which can then in turn raise your profile and, and bring in other work and I mean that's always a very very hard uh, sort of balancing act because as I say you, you still need to make a living. And then I also found when I was running my old tuning shop, you know, everyone wanted to pay for their tuning work or engine builds with exposure dollars. And you know, uh, a drifter with uh, 84 followers on Instagram is is probably not really going to give me that much exposure. So yeah, I I, I digress anyway. I, I think we've probably sort of got got a, a a nice succinct answer to that in there somewhere. Just have to have to dig it out. <laughs> All right. Lastly, Sander, for today, if people want to follow you and see what you're up to, where are they best to to do that? How should they how should they follow you? Yeah, I'm I'm not posting much right now just because I'm really knee deep in like a, a lot of really interesting projects, which I'm super thankful for, for tons of reasons. But uh, I try to keep interesting content coming that's like pretty bullshit free on my Instagram, which is Lambda of one, uh, one word, no spaces. And then Facebook uh, is my Facebook link is tragically not that same thing. It is just Obsidian Motorsport, uh, one word. Always good when you can have two completely different uh, usernames across your social media. That's always very helpful. But we will be helpful by putting links to both of those in the show notes. Look, Sandra, once again, thanks so much for coming back on. As usual, it's been uh, a goldmine of information and you know, we just don't get to get an understanding of these deep dive details uh, too often. So really thankful for you sharing all of that, uh, both the good and the bad. We hope that the bad is now behind this car and look forward to seeing what happens over the next 12 months and uh, the, the next running of Pikes Peak. Yeah, Andre, thank you. I, I really enjoy talking to you. It's just it's it's a it's a great pleasure of mine to speak to you and talk about the details because I think a lot of that gets lost and it's always fun to show all the work that everybody's done on this car. Definitely. All right, we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Sander. Okay, see ya. If you enjoyed this episode of Tuned In with Sander, we'd love it if you could drop a review on your chosen podcasting platform. These reviews really help us to grow our audience and that in turn helps us to continue to get more high quality guests. To say thanks, each week we'll be picking a random reviewer and sending them out an HPA t-shirt anywhere in the world. Also, this is a great place to ask any questions you might have too and I'll do my best to answer them if your review gets picked. So this week a big shout out to Harold from Detroit who's said this podcast has been great in helping sustain my hunger for knowledge, the diversity of the content is great and helps shed light on other areas of motorsport and industry that I hadn't considered prior. The information is delivered well as it's not spoon fed but it isn't a blast from a fire hose either. I find myself learning something new with every show. I look forward to using the podcast discount code towards some online courses. Keep the great content coming. Well, thanks for your feedback there, Harold. Great to hear that you are enjoying and learning from the show. If you get in touch with your t-shirt size and shipping details, we'll fire a fresh tea straight out to you. All right, that concludes our interview. And before we sign off, I just wanted to mention for anyone who's been perhaps hiding under a rock and hasn't heard of High Performance Academy before, we are an online training school and we specialize in teaching a range of performance automotive topics, everything from engine tuning and engine building through to wiring, car suspension and wheel alignment, uh, data analysis and race driver education. Now remember, you've got that coupon code. You can use podcast75 at the checkout to get 70 $25 off the purchase of your first course. You'll find our full course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses. Important to mention that when you purchase a course from us, that course is yours for life as well. It never expires. You can rewatch the course as many times as you like, whenever you like. 
The purchase of a course will also give you three months of access to our gold membership. That gives you access to our private members only forum, which is the perfect place to get answers to your specific questions. You'll also get access to our regular weekly members webinars, which is where we touch on a particular topic in the performance automotive realm. We dive into that topic for about an hour. If you can watch live, you can ask questions and get answers in real time. If the time zones don't work for you, that's fine too. You're going to get access as a gold member to our previous webinar archive. We've got close to 300 hours of existing content in that archive. It is an absolute gold mine. So remember that coupon code PODCAST75. Check out our course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses.